Over the last several months, I have hinted to the fact that I was going to share a deep dive into some of the history of my now two and a half year old dog, this. Some of the things that we've gone through together and some of the great observations that I've made that I believe are going to help many, many people. So this is probably going to be a two part episode, but I can't wait to share all that I've learned. So let's jump right into it. Imagine this. Imagine you have a 19 month old performance bred border collie one that comes from a long line of world championship, world team dogs, four generations of dogs from different countries that have been on world teams that have won medals at the world championships. And this 19 month old puppy is going to go to her first ever seminar with somebody you really respect. And the best of all is the seminars at your own facility, like it's an environment that your puppy is comfortable in. And to add to the excitement, two of her litter mates are also going to be at the exact same seminar. Now you recognize that one of the litter mates is a far, far more advanced and you're okay with that. You are excited to show off your skills. Just think about how you would feel knowing that you've got this long line of successful dogs. And this is the third generation that you've owned of the four generations of world team dogs. And the seminar begins. It's a nice small seminar. So that's another advantage to these dogs. But at 19 months old, every dog I've ever owned was trialing in agility by the time they were 19 month old for better or for worse. I don't know that any dog in my future will ever be because of the complexity of the sport and the complexity of the skills, but every other dog I'd ever owned had been in the ring and succeeding by the time they were 19 months old. And this is grandmother was actually named to her first world team before the age of three. And so the seminar begins and I get out there and this falls apart. She will tug for a little bit, but then she disengages and sniffs the floor. I go to something she knows and can do well, like wrap a cone and she might wrap part of it and then get wide and slow down and look around. So I am not discouraged at all. I recognize this isn't the dog I'm used to training, but I'm going to do things that will make her happy. A restraint recall. She gets excited about the restraint recall but then won't pick up the toy after. Sometimes I'll do a restraint recall in the middle of this workshop and she just wanders off from chasing me and goes and visits strangers. Sometimes acting like she doesn't even know me. And so I try to do all of the things I know she loves to do, put her through a tunnel, which she might go through fast, but at the end won't pick up the toy. At one point in the seminar, I actually say, well, this is going to look great on video when you're on the podium at a world championship. This is going to be great video when you're on the podium at a world championship. Yeah. Yes. I think that just shows my attitude towards my dogs that behavior is just information. It doesn't really matter. Would I have wanted her to have had a great time and been ripping around like her litter mate was at the same seminar. On one video, you see this having an absolute meltdown and her litter mates just zipping in and out behind us, having a phenomenal time doing brilliant work. Certainly not what I'd wish for, but it was what I had. And so from that point, I knew I needed to dig deeper. And what I'm going to share with you is a timeline of things looking back at the records and know that you can get some realizations when you look at a history, when you look at your experiences that you maybe are not picking up in the moment. And I think it's super important to share this with everybody because over the past two years of working with this, I have thought of so many dogs that I've seen at seminars that I've been presenting that have done similar things. And I think, oh my goodness, you can't dog train something that isn't a dog training problem. And that's why I never got discouraged. I knew there was an answer. I just knew that I didn't have it. As I mentioned in podcast episode number 189, when I sat down and looked at my problems with this and I thought, if it's not dog training, let's rule out that you suddenly all of your dog training ability fell out of your brains. What else could it be? And I came up with those seven things that I mentioned in podcast episode number 189 and big spoiler alert, I believe for this, 
it came down to primarily nutrition, possibly hormones, and also some discomfort in her own body, a pain and brain fog, I believe. So I'll get to more of that later, but I want to share with you what I observe because I believe there's so many people that are listening or watching this podcast that are going to be able to identify with symptoms that they've seen in their own dogs, maybe current dogs, maybe past dogs. And so under the category of there are no coincidences, if you remember in podcast episode number 36, and I'm describing why I picked this and how I knew she was mine before she was born. I knew what she was going to look like. And I declared at birth because I knew I had a vision of exactly what she was going to look like. And her name came from a book I was reading, one of my favorite books called The Resilience Project, which is really ironic because our journey has become a project of resiliency, both for this and for myself as a dog trainer. There are no coincidences. In that book, there was a young boy from India who was so grateful for everything he saw and had in his life. And every morning with a big smile on his face, he would point to something and say, this, this is what I'm happy for today. This is what I'm grateful for today. And the big message of the book was the message about gratitude, empathy, and mindfulness which the irony is not lost on me, that that has been the three most important things in my journey with this. I would put the word love in there. And I almost named this gem because of the books, Gratitude, Empathy, and Mindfulness. So this story goes back to day three of birth and she developed diarrhea. And the diarrhea, I we had it cultured, nothing ever came up, nothing ever showed but it never went away. And so, of course, she was treated with antibiotics. She continued to have diarrhea. One of the other puppies got it maybe a week later, and then the other two had it for maybe a couple of days. And once they were introduced to solid food, all the diarrhea went away. And from that point on, this was every bit of normal puppy as the other three puppies in her litter. And at 10 weeks old, all of the puppies were going to their new homes. And this, the, one of the things I noticed about her is she was a ferocious tugger. She loved to tug. But that last week when they were with me, I did some little puppy grids with them. And I did notice that I've never seen a puppy use her body the way she did in grids. In that most puppies, and we're doing grids, we're doing little bumps. And most puppies will come in with two front feet together and punch the ground. And then their back end comes underneath it punches the ground, and then they go over this little wee bump. All puppies are the same. It happens with, doesn't matter the breed, it happens the same, but not with this. She came in and split her front legs, and as if she was trotting through one, two, and then trotted through with her back legs, one, two. I noticed it. I took note of it. I tried to change the distance of the little bump, but I really didn't give it a second thought. Come on. She's a 10 week old puppy who loves life, who has no care in the world, who's so much fun and is so lovable and is so darn beautiful. So she started out except for that one small thing, similar to the rest of her litter mates. And then the next thing that I noticed was the way she sat. There were two different ways she sat. If she sat straight up, she had her rear paws going very east west and sometimes would put an anterior tilt to her pelvis, almost like taking weight off her back, it seemed. But it was that east-west leg. And I know that I spoke about it on social media. I did a lot of plank work, trying to help her to get her legs back underneath her. I wanted her paws in alignment under her knees in line with her hocks at the back. It took a lot of work. It probably took almost a year. The other way she liked to sit is to roll back on her pelvis to take all of the weight off of her feet, almost like tater salad sits sometimes. (laughs) I don't like like this big fat cat that just had a big meal. So those were the two ways that she liked to sit as a puppy. Again, I took note. I just thought, you know, we have different problems. Some puppies like to have sloppy puppy sits. That's cool. I'll just keep working on getting that nice tight sit. So from three months to six months, she learned all of our recolor games. She learned them pretty quickly, but she really lacked that border collie drive. Even on a restraint recalls, she never really got that 
pull to get away. And if she got a little more excited, she never came out like galloping. She came out loping, maybe a little bit of a run, but never ever driving. The only time I ever saw her go crazy with drive was when she got a little bit older and I would let her run with her mother in the field. And then it was like all abandoned was gone and she would hit another gear. She could cut like a border collie herding sheep. She was beautiful to watch, but I never allowed that to happen too much because I didn't want that to become an obsession for her. And so I ended up using her love of chasing her mother to transfer value to something that I was having a really tough time with building any value for staying at my side in reinforcement zone to say, walk on a loose leash. She just didn't want to do that. It is now one of her best skills, all because I use the reward of going for a run or going to chase your mother. And so looking back, what I can now see is she loved chasing birds too. Chasing birds and chasing her mother were activities of adrenaline. The things that I was asking her to do were things that you would expect a burst of dopamine, but it's like the dopamine hits never happened for her. Or if they did, they happened in very, very, very low doses, which is why I did a deep dive on dopamine in one of my podcasts, podcast episode number 174. And that brings us to something that maybe will be more commonplace. And some of these other things that I noticed were nuances. She was developing a lower resiliency to fail. And around seven to nine months is when she started to have serious resource guarding problems. And I shared all the things that I did with that in podcast episode number 66. As she got older and I assume started to get more hormonal, she got severely reactive to dogs she didn't know. I mean, she was terrified. Now, there were two things going on. One was, it was the summer of 2021. And so we were in and out of lockdown here in Canada, actually more in lockdown than not. And so other than her early puppy classes, when she was three or four months old, she really didn't get out much. I forgot to mention she had terrible car sickness as well. So the GI problems, I really wasn't connecting at that point. And then the reactivity. So then we stopped doing anything except working on behavior mod on the reactivity towards dogs. And I would use baseball diamonds and conservation areas. And her generalization of some of her games wasn't going as great as I would have expected. I would do them in my house here, in a training area downstairs, in my bedroom, in the building. And again, it was hit or miss. And I just didn't see her becoming addicted to training the way you would expect a border collie would become addicted to training. Heck, my bulldog became addicted to training. Little things like if I used a remote feeder, it would take more than like two or three button pushes for the bulldog to say, got this, race out for the cookie, race back to try it again. Where this would like kind of gallop out to get her cookie. She loved food and would like walk her trot back with her little tail going bing, 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 bing. There was never any joy. And that became my number one criteria. Number one, if I can help you to have more joy in your life, your reactivity, your fears are going to go down and your love of work is going to come up. So that became my number one. And so I look at these dogs who at certain ages become more reactive and I wonder, are they not dealing with the same problem that this was dealing with? And it was a combination of nutrition and brain fog. And also around the same time, this had this unusual startle response to noises. Now, swagger and momentum are afraid of thunder and afraid of gunshots. Swagger more than momentum. This has no problem with thunder or actually she gets excited. She loves thunder and lightning. No problem with thunder, no problem with gunshots. But if you dropped something, she would pin her ears and leave the room. 
if she anticipated you were going to drop something, something as simple as your keys or a book, or she had an unusually high startle response and then would develop phobias to area. So a lot more counter conditioning to help her overcome these fear responses, both to noises, but particular to the areas that she was developing these phobias to. And so I looked for opportunities to bring joy. I had at that time shaped Tater to chase the squirrels away from the bird feeder. I had a bird feeder on my window. I like to watch the birds eating while I ate my breakfast. And so Tater just had to put up his paws on the window ledge and the squirrels would run away. And so I thought that was great. Well, I put it on cue. The, the cue was the word squirrel. And it didn't take this long to get in on the act and start screaming and running and barking. And I thought that was amazing. I'd never seen her get excited about anything other than chasing her mother. So I put that on cue for her. Now, eventually it became an obsession where she would just rest her head on the windowsill all day waiting for squirrels. So I had to remove the bird feeder, sadly, because that's no way for any dog to live either. And that Behavior will come back if you say the word squirrel, but it's gone from her just waiting all day for a squirrel to show up. And so it was always about where can I create more joy for this dog? And about the same time between nine and 12 months, what I also noticed is if I took her out and did any training, if I trained her down in the basement, if I took her out to the building, if I did anything that required her in a thinking brain, it didn't matter if it was a three minute session, she would come into the house, she would go into my bedroom, on my bed, lay out flat and stay there for two to three hours and decompress. It didn't matter what went on. Someone could knock on the door and she would still be there decompressing. Now she could go for an hour hike and that wouldn't bother her at all. She could chase her mother and we put a GPS on her and she would go like 15 kilometers on a walk chasing her mother. No decompression needed. Only when you put her into her thinking brain and even for a period as short as five minutes. So all of these things were obvious to me. And so I decided at a year old, there's no sense even attempting to train agility with her because what was going to happen is this dog who had very little joy for anything. She never said no to training and she always loved to tug, but I didn't want that blase attitude to be transferred to agility. And so what I did is I focused on her fitness. And every week I would work on new exercises. Carolyn McIntyre would come here and often give me new exercises for her to work on, to strengthen her body. We fixed that sit of hers. And I also started doing jump grids. So my good friend, Kim Collins would send me jump grids to do with her. And jump grids I thought would be great because it was an easy predictor for her to get a reinforcement. And there was no thinking because the grids dictated the process for her. But what I know now is in order to create more dopamine, we really need a negative prediction error and not the same reward all the time. It actually was never a bad thing. She did the grids. She liked the grids, but she never like fell in love, like swagger by his second week, by as a 10 week old puppy, he was obsessed with grids. That never really happened for this, but it was something that we could do that was building a phenomenal skill in her. Her ability to read distance was amazing, but it was never growing that passion to do the jumps. By the time she was 19 months old, leading up to that seminar, she had a lot of great one jump skills. She knew her directionals. She knew a foot target. I would not put her near weave poles. I would not put her near any contact equipment other than just doing little games on them. Because again, I didn't want her to walk a dog walk. But also at that time, her grandmother, a feature, got sick and had cancer. And so my whole focus turned to feature. And maybe was that good or was that bad? For this, all we did was played games together. And I really wasn't focused on getting anywhere with her training other than, again, the criteria of joy. And so I didn't do as many training sessions with her. She did get lots of walks. She learned to love to swim that summer. And so I did use the value of the pond to teach her two by two weaving, which was brilliant. Her weave pulls by the pond 
after just a few weeks, they became amazing. And that's where I did see a glint of joy. And that's when I did believe, oh my gosh, maybe we're going to push through this. So as she progressed her jump grids, I noticed she, again, wasn't using her body correctly. And sometimes instead of pushing off with two back paws equally, she would actually leave the ground for the first jump. And as she landed for the second jump, she would rotate her right hip so that her right paw was kind of in the middle of her from behind. So she only pushed off with her right leg and never used her left leg to push off for the next consecutive jumps. And of course, a lot of experts said there's something wrong with this dog. She's in a lot of pain. She's got to be dysplastic. And so when it was possible, Kim took this down to the foremost experts in the world on orthopedics, my friends, Dr. Sherman and Deb Knapp, to give her like bumper to bumper, a thorough workup. So of course, they ultrasound all her joints. They x-rayed her joints. They put her on their high tech zillion dollar gait analysis. They measured all of her muscles. They did stance analyzers. And what Sherman said to me after was, I've never seen a more balanced athlete. Usually dogs favor one side or another. She was perfect. She was 60, 40 front to back. And she was 30, 30, 20, 20 in his analysis. Her hips look beautiful. Her shoulders look beautiful. Everything looked beautiful. So I'm slowly checking off my list of seven things that could be causing this dog to not love what I knew she should love. And that led us up to the seminar where I thought she had those foundational skills. She couldn't do what her older litter mate was doing. He was doing full courses at 19 months. He was amazing, but she still could do one jumps and one tunnel and wrap a cone. That's what I thought, but that's not what I got. And shortly after that seminar, Feature passed away. And so, in my journey with Feature, I came to meet an amazing naturopath from Austria. And it took me a few weeks, but then I asked her, I said, could you help me with this? And she, of course, said yes. And it was a week before my next seminar with this was supposed to happen. My friend, Jalko Gora from Croatia was coming in. Now, Two more staggering things about this is progression. One, I can't guarantee has anything to do with her journey, but all of her litter mates grew to be 22 to 22 and a half inches tall, maybe slightly under 22, one of them. Two females, one male. The tallest is one of the females. This was four inches shorter. She stopped growing. She didn't grow a smidge after the age of seven months. She's 18 and a half inches tall. So that was one thing. The other thing is, A normal border collie, when you're doing jump grids, they will put in a bounce, meaning they'll just hit the ground and push off. And you can keep growing that bounce. So for a border collie, you might start at six feet and you can grow that out to Swagger would do 15 feet. Wiggins, one of Momentum's litter mates would bounce 18 feet, but most border collies will bounce anywhere from 10 to 15 feet generally in a jump grid. And they would add a one stride when it got too big to bounce. So a one stride would be the dog lands, they take one stride and then they leave for the next jump. And that one stride would grow so that they would one stride 16 feet, 18 feet, all the way up to 19 or 20 feet. Most border collies could. Now, again, some of the bigger males could one stride more than that, but on average, that's what we got. Now, I had been doing grids everywhere with this. I did grids at least three to four days a week. Fun grids. I did grids outside. I did grids inside. I would go to other places and do grids. I did so many grids with her. So, that was something she knew how to do. That was something that she could predict there'd be a reinforcement. But even after all those grids... You can see, if you jump over to YouTube and watch this video, this is the end of a grid I just did with her. It was a longer grid. It was in the summer of 2022. And immediately after she finished the grid, we were done. Grids, for me, they would only last a few minutes. 
I wouldn't ask her for much, just a few minutes of your time. We'll do some grids. Then we'll go off and do something fun. And the moment I tell her she can go chase the birds, she takes off like this is how she ran. She could run so fast after her mother or after birds, but she could not do that in work with me. Anything that involved thinking, she could not do it. And so from August until now, April, I had worked with Kim Collins, brilliant jumping coach. And we had created some amazing skills and confidence with Thissy because when she was even 15 months old, she would not jump higher than 12 inches. If you put it over 12 inches, she would try to go under it, would not do it. And Kim, with Kim's help, we got her in a set point going up to 22, 24 inches on one jump. But her bounce, she would not bounce more than eight feet. Remember a normal border collie? They would bounce maybe 15 feet, but at least 10. She would not bounce more than eight feet. And that one stride, it came in at 15 feet. And so there's a lot of symptoms that I want you, this is a long podcast and that's why it's going to be two parts. There's a lot of symptoms that it's easy to just ignore and go, that's quirky, that's my dog, or that's the way he holds his blank. But if you put all of these symptoms in order, they will add up to something. And so you've got to know you cannot dog train something that isn't a dog training problem. And I'm going to give you a spoiler alert for the next installment of Shape by Dog, where I talk about what I did and where we're at now is I made some diet changes. And three days after I had just done a grid where I got a bounce at eight feet and a one stride at 15. I did nothing else with her. I changed her diet. I went out and I set up the grid again and she bounced with power at eight feet and then bounced nine feet and then bounced 10 feet and didn't put in a stride until 11 feet and then didn't put in a one stride until 12 feet. Remember she would one stride all the way up to 15 and then at 15 feet would put in a second stride after just changing her diet and doing nothing else. Now she not only would one stride 12 feet, she did 13 feet and 14 and 15, all the way up to 20 feet. Nothing changed. She had never one strided beyond 15 feet in her life. And suddenly she was one striding up to 20. So definitely that change of nutrition made a massive difference. It was like a brain fog cleared for her. It was like a pain in her gut was gone. And so in the next Shape by Dog episode, I'm going to share with you why I think this was so dramatic and knowing I was feeding the best dog food in Canada. And I would put that up with the best dog food anywhere in the world. I'm going to share with you why it wasn't the right food for this, what I did, all of the retraining that I've been doing since then and where we're at right now. listen to podcast episode number 203, you would have heard the story of my journey with my two and a half year old border collie, this. Today, I share the rest of the story. Before I get into today, I just need to say, I am reporting on my journey. I am not a veterinarian. I am not a qualified nutritionist. Anything I say is just sharing data of what I did. Your journey will be unique to you and your dog. And I strongly encourage you that you seek out the help of a health professional and your veterinarian before you try to undertake any of the things that I've done. I got to the place in our last time together where I had a 19 month old puppy who was basically shutting down, had no joy to work, had little connection to me, was exhausted after work, had to decompress and what she loved was she loved birds. She loved chasing birds, chasing her mother, and she loved to swim. And for anybody who's afraid, I love birds too. So I never, ever get near the birds, but her and the barn swallows, they have this relationship. It's a fun story, but those are things that I could use to help build drive, but you can't dog train a problem that isn't a dog training problem. And so I had come to the conclusion back in March of 2022, that this was a nutrition problem. And so I was going to seek out people to help me with. And I was so blessed to have been introduced to a naturopath from Austria 
who was willing to help me. She was a recaller student and had the world of knowledge. And what I've come to learn is that what she does over there is she collaborates with other natural paths. They collaborate data. So they're exponentially able to learn about challenges that people have with their dogs. And she knew exactly what I was going through with this. And she did know how she could help me. And so some of the things that I'm going to tell you are not what a veterinarian would do. And I just want to be very clear and upfront with that. The first thing that Andrea had me do was send pictures of my dog's gums from the top gums and the bottom gums in between the two canines. That seems weird, right? And let me just preface this by saying I do feed raw and none of this has changed my faith in raw. I was a kibble feeder and I do believe that raw is the best way for me to feed my dogs. That's what I have discovered. But I think there could be flaws in the raw food industry. And I really hope that manufacturers of raw food in North America will listen to this podcast. And what I discovered with Feature, who was dying of cancer, was her gums between her two canines were very, very dark red. It was like she had braces of dark, dark red mark above them. Now, every step along my nutrition journey with my dogs, I collaborate with the brilliant Dr. Lori Codger of Healthy Dog Workshop. She's a brilliant veterinarian for formulating diets. If you want to feed your dog your own diet, Dr. Codger is the one to help with that. And she has helped me with that. And she said, that looks crazy. Like that's just got to be pigment. And so she started to look at the dog's gums as she started to examine them every day at work. But what I did is I looked at all of the dogs here and Feature definitely had this black mark that nobody else had. This had one little spot and Momentum had two little spots. Nobody else really had any marks on their gums. So then I asked all the people who own puppies from Momentum's litter that were now seven years old. I said, can you send me pictures of your dog's gums? And I was shocked to see the dogs who fed the lowest protein in their raw diet had no marks on their dog's gums. And as the level of protein went up, the marks on the gums went up. So the two dogs in the litter that were fed a prey model, one was a bitch and one was a dog. They had that black mark. And so what Andrea explained to me is that's a sign of hyperacidity in the body. And it's not surprising with the North American style of raw feeding. And she said, what happens when a dog gets a mouthful of beef, their brain instantly goes, Hey, that's beef and shouts down to the gut. Let's dump a bunch of acid to digest that beef. And the dog swallows the beef and there's all this acid, but the beef has already been pre-digested because all of the raw in North America is already minced. So there's not a lot of digesting that needs to happen. That's the first problem. The second problem is raw food in North America contains between 49 and 80% protein. And that's a big problem because that too contributes to the hyperacidity of a dog's body. And if you think about it from a human point of view, we know that there are people in the world that can digest fat better than many of us can. There's other people in the world that can digest like rice or high carb diets better than many of us can. And we know that different diets are related to different parts of the world. So think about border collies, where they're from. My dog, this is father is generationally sheepdog from Wales way back. And that's where the breed originated on the border of Scotland and England, Ireland, Wales. Guess what they were eating 200 or 300 years ago when this dog breed was being developed. Do you think they were giving their dogs 49% protein when they were eating potatoes? So is a chance that my dog was getting too much protein. And so I asked Dr. Codger if she could help me. Who do I talk to? I want to know when they formulated raw food, did they do studies that said, let's look at feeding dogs 80%, 70%, 60%, 50, 40, 30, 20, because kibble on a dry matter basis is 20% protein and raw food on a dry matter basis is 50 to 80 and she said, well, the man you want to talk to is Steve Brown. He's the godfather of raw feeding. He wrote the book, Unlocking the Canine Ancestral Diet. And anybody that I've spoke to in the raw food business, the 
high up veterinarians, they just speak about Steve Brown in the highest regard. He's formulated a lot of the raw diets across North America. And Steve graciously agreed to join my inner circle for a conversation about raw feeding. And so I asked him, were there studies? And he said, no, there were no studies, but we knew we wanted to get away from all of the cereal that was in kibble. We knew that was killing dogs. And so we couldn't fill the raw food up with fat. Of course, dogs might get sick, fat might go rancid. And so we filled it up with protein, but protein can be very expensive. So we filled it up with a lot of organ meat when we filled it up with protein. And guess what liver does in an animal system? It collects all the toxins that goes through that animal. So I then found a site, Dr. Tobias in Canada, who would do heavy metal analysis. You just send samples of your dog's fur. And I found out some interesting things. Only this had very high levels of mercury, arsenic, and aluminum in her test sample. She also had tin off the charts, which could affect the dog's ability to get zinc or selenium from their food. And in the analysis, you got back something called the performance index, which tells you your dog's endurance level and speed level. I did all my dogs, by the way. This is endurance level was normal. Her speed level was well below normal. Fascinating. And the report went on to say that it could be related to her thyroid functioning. And so nutrition and hormones were what I was left with looking at some very brilliant, brilliant people that helped me out in clearing the heavy metals from her system with her diet. That immediate change that I made that I mentioned in the last episode that immediately her brain started functioning better. Immediately she went from being able to bounce only eight feet in a grid to within days being able to bounce 11 feet and one striding up to 20 feet. All that I did was I cut her food in half gave her half of the meat patty and add fresh vegetables and fruit and some healthy fats to that. And what Andrea wanted me to do was, she said, some dogs will require higher carbs. And she wanted me, once I did a little more fat and a little more carbs in the form of fresh fruit and vegetables and making a green smoothie to put on my dog's food every day. And this was amazing. And she said, hey, let's give her more carbs and less fat. And overnight, she turned into a raving bitch, a raving, like growling at everybody in my house. And I said, whoa, I'm pulling the plug on this high carb diet for her. It was crazy. It was like not even my dog. Put her back onto moderate carbs and moderate fat. And she was a different dog. So that happened on April 12th. And on April 14th, my friend Jelko Gore came in from Croatia. Now I had done virtually nothing with this after the seminar on March 12th, because my girl feature passed away and I really was not in a place to do any dog training. So I told Jelko, I can do some skills. Well, by the end of the first day, he said, she understands some skills. Let's put it together in a sequence. If you want to jump over to YouTube, you can see a little sequence of her running with Jalco running with her toy. She loves to chase fast things. I don't classify as one of those fast things. She loved to chase Jalco and my dog who just one month previous couldn't focus to even do a tunnel was suddenly doing agility. It was a mind blow to me. And so further to that, I worked with an osteopath and my chiropractor And my natural path did a lot of energy clearing for this. And then I met another fascinating woman. Danny was somebody who was recommended to me when I put my plea on Facebook saying, my dog is dying. Can anyone suggest anyone to help me? I got two health practitioners names. One was the natural path in Austria. The other was the herbalist who lived just an hour and a bit from me. And it's fascinating what she does. She uses these probes that are brass and she balances you or me first, touching acupuncture points that relate to all of the systems in your body. And when she's finished balancing me, then she balances the dog. And lo and behold, guess what system was completely out of whack on this? Her endocrine system, the system responsible for hormones. And so that made a massive difference. 
So now I have a dog with a clearer mind whose stomach isn't hurting her. I mean, I didn't know that, but I can only imagine. So now I have to go back and I can do the good dog training. I have to go back and help her to understand how to have joy. And I'd love to say like overnight, it fixed just like the jump grids did, but it didn't. I came up with new games for her. I taught her to speak on cue on the word, are you a scary good girl? Are you a scary fast girl? Are you a scary smart girl? The word scary would instantly get her barking and jumping and bouncing. I taught her to line up between my legs because then she was confident and secure. And those are two things that help make a difference. In September of 2022, I decided to reach out to an old friend of mine who just happens to be the world's authority on the sport of fly ball and asked him if he had any classes. And he said, you know what? I could put one together for people who want to do agility and fly ball. And this has been going to weekly fly ball. And what that's done for her, she has an activity she can be fast without thinking. And that is amazing. She's not breaking any speed records, but we're not even putting it together. So it's been six months that we've been doing weekly fly ball classes. And of course we miss some for holidays, but we still haven't put it all together. That's what great dog training does. That's what a great instructor does. They train the dog in front of them. And so slowly by slowly, we're building up this dog's drive. One of the other characteristics of this I forgot to mention is whenever I ran momentum or whenever there are other dogs working in my building, she just fell asleep on a cot. She never looked at the other dogs. She didn't care what they were doing. Anytime it wasn't her turn, she was sound asleep, laying flat out on her side. I just not normal. Now she's a crazy barking lunatic and I'm okay with it. I've done nothing to try and curb it. So restraint recalls into setups, barking at me, lining up between my legs, having somebody run and her chase or reward. Those are things that have been important. Plus I've got this out to a lot of new locations to generalize this happy, joyful dog. Sometimes it's not so happy or joyful. Two steps forward, one step back. I'm okay because it's all about progress, not perfection. We're moving forward to a place where she is loving what she's doing. And I'm loving seeing her come out of her shell. I'm loving seeing this new dog. Her need for that long decompression after work is no longer there. She's tired like any other dog, but she doesn't have to lay flat out and go unconscious. I make sure I keep my sessions super short with her as we were growing her drive for different behaviors. For example, weave poles were great near the pond, but they were horrible in the building. And so I've done very little with weave poles. She knows how to weave. We're going to build up that speed eventually. She's okay, not breaking any speed records. I taught her to do a running seesaw rather than having her stop anywhere. Don't want her to think. And we have a running dog walk, a running A-frame, running seesaw just made sense for a dog like her. I go back to basics a lot with her to remind her with all of the verbal cues that she knows, I want her to have joy in every single one of them. So it's like I go back and do some really fundamental things. We have a game that I've called the veto game after its inventor that I met in Italy. It's a simple game that she loves. It helps to engage her in a way that she's more joyful. I've been very intentional about playing games that create dopamine spikes with her, where she can't predict when the reinforcement's coming, when she can't predict what the reinforcement is. And that's helped her a ton to be more driven with the sport. I know a lot of you really just want to know more about the nutrition. And one of the things that I will tell you that I do, I do not feed any organ meat at all to my dogs, any of my dogs. From what Andrea told me, feeding them for a puppy is great, but not after a year old. And so what I would love to find is a manufacturer that feeds really good quality meat in chunks, but without the organ meat. Because I can find manufacturers where I can get the chunks for my dogs, but I cannot get the chunks without the organ meat, or I can get the meat without the organ meat, but it's minced and it's not in chunks. And I got to tell you, when we changed this as diet, at that time she weighed 31 pounds and we put her on a detox diet, her weight dropped down to 26.4 pounds. There was a lot of people in my world that were questioning that I was putting my faith in this woman I'd never met in Austria, but I just knew 
that this was what my dog needed. And slowly she did start to gain weight. One of the mistakes that we made is we started bumping up her food, giving her more volume, but guess what? Her guts couldn't take it. Her guts weren't the greatest to begin with and putting more volume in just caused her to poop out whole pieces of potato, whole pieces of strawberry. And so guess what? We started taking pictures of her poop. And when she wasn't digesting her veggies, we would blend them for her for maybe a month. And then we'd slowly integrate some whole pieces again, looking at how well she was digesting, basing that on what we did with the food, whether we blended it or gave it whole. So two or three times a week, we have a big steaming party here where we steam all kinds of veggies, put them into canning jars and put them in the fridge. And that gets fed to the dogs for two or three days. We blend up a green smoothie with all kinds of great greens. We mix that up daily. We put in an apple in there and mix that up. What greens get put in there every week. I tell my students, just put those in ice cube trays and pop them out one or two of them to your dogs. If you want to do what you're doing and just make a couple little alterations. Again, I am not a nutritionist. I'm not a veterinarian. My hope is that the raw food world will start providing chunks and no organ meat to those of us who really want it. I got to tell you, there's a dog food company that I love here in Canada. And I can get, it's like a beef steak from them. The bone is in and it's somewhere around eight or 10 ounces. I give that to this once a week. The next two days are when she always puts on her most weight. So seeing her chew, I got to tell you, it freaked me out the first time. She's chewing this meat, swallowing it, bring it back up, chewing it, swallowing it. I text Andrea, what's going on? And she texts me right back from Austria. She said, that's the way dogs are supposed to eat the food. Just relax. And she said over in Europe, most of her clients can get whole chunks food without the organ meat in. I'm hoping here in North America, that will be an option to those of us who want it as well at some point in time. And so I'm not telling you to change your diet. I really do believe in the raw food diet. I don't believe my dogs in particular need that much protein. I've changed all my dogs to half the level of protein And there's some great formulators out there like Dr. Lori Codger who can help you formulate your dog's diet. So it is balanced. And so where are we at now? This just participated in another seminar with Jess Patterson, the same presenter that she was with back in March of 2022. And it was a different dog. It was a different experience for me. And I decided to enter her in our world team tryouts, which is happening in just over a week. I'm not entering her with the hopes of winning a place on the team. I'm actually only entering her because the event is five minutes from my home, but I'm excited by it. And I'm going to keep you all posted. I'm excited to see what joy I can get away from home in a big, exciting, busy venue. And here's my plan. I'll run the first run. If I see joy, I'll run the second run. Anytime I see joy missing from what my dog is doing, I can declare FEO, I can bring a toy in the ring, and I can make sure every moment of her time at that event is a joyful one. So wish me luck, wish this luck, but most of all, I want you to see I get that not many people are going to go to the extent that I've gone to with my dog. I just believe in letting your dreams be bigger than your challenges. I heard this line from a woman a few weeks ago, and I loved it. It said, never let your setbacks be bigger than your comeback. And I'm like, that's this E and I. We're not going to let our setbacks be bigger than our comeback. And it's ongoing. She'll be three in August. And I know as she gets physically stronger, she is now almost back up to 30 pounds. She had an unfortunate setback where she got sick a few weeks ago, but we're getting there. And I know I'm seeing the joy in her in many more places. To prepare for world team tryouts, it's on dirt. And so what I've been doing is I've been going over to the venue and renting it once a month and playing with her over there. So anything you can do to help bring more confidence to your dog, just do it. Going out of your way and playing in dirt, not my favorite thing but seeing my dog have fun sure is my favorite thing. I'd love to hear your comments. I'd love to hear if you can identify your dog in some of the things that I'm talking about. 
I've talked to many border collie people who actually had to retire their dog before they even got started because they had very similar challenges to what I had with thisy. So if this is you, I hope it gives you hope that answers are there for you. But just remember, you can't dog train something that isn't a dog training problem. If you listen in on podcast episode number 203 or 204, you would have learned about my two and a half year old dog, this, and the fact that she was coming along to world team tryouts with her mother, Momentum. Well, today I'm going to share what my plan was, how I achieved it, and how it could impact you in your dog training. I mentioned in the last couple of podcasts that I was going to take this to the world team tryouts. Now, was she ready to be trying out for our world team? Heck no. But I mentioned that my criteria for her was joy. Now that is so vague. How can joy be a criteria? Well, I'll share how it can be and how it was a criteria. I'm also going to share with you the exact plan that I used that I think anybody can use if they are going to say a class that they want to inject more joy in, or maybe a match that they want to inject more joy in. What I was going to was an agility competition where you could declare yourself as for exhibition only, or some people call it not for competition, NFC runs, whatever they are. I'm going to share the exact strategy that I used. And I really think it's going to make a massive difference to you and your dog. But first let's talk about my attitude going in. And all I kept thinking was I have this criteria of joy, which like Susan, that's just so vague. This has great agility skills. She doesn't have the confidence to show a lot of speed and enthusiasm when doing those agility skills. Now, it's not like she's terribly slow. She doesn't get distracted normally, but going into this competition, I planned a month ahead of time, but I knew no matter what, I wanted to have a light heart in order to create this atmosphere of joy for this. And so I contacted my friends at For My Merles, where I get my tug toys and my leashes. And I said to Brian and Shirley, I want to create a leash for, for this, that when I look at it, it just sparks joy. When I look at it, it makes me lighthearted. So they came up with this great leash, beautiful, bright colors. If you're listening to this podcast, it's pink, it's blue, it's purple. And they wrote her name on the collar in a really funky font that just makes me smile. And that's exactly what I said to them. They did a little extra, put Handling 360 on the handle. I said, I want to pick up this leash at the tryouts and just be happy and just be grateful for how far that this has come in her progress in loving to live life to the fullest. And so I planned everything for this event for her. I planned when she got her meals at minimum of two and a half hours before she was supposed to go into the ring. I planned what toy I would use. I had somebody standing outside the ring so that when I finished the run and I probably was (gasps) sucking air that they could enthusiastically tug with her. So it wasn't just up to me to bring that joy at the end of the run. So we were all ready. First run, she was just geared up to go in the ring. I've never seen her so amped up to go in the ring. I got her lined up between my legs. She was actually growling at me as I left. And as I was leaving the start line, the gate said, oh wait, they want to rake the weave poles. So can you just wait for a minute? And really what I should have done, I should have taken my dog off the line. I should have gone outside the ring and played with her some more and brought her in at that same peaked up stake. There's lesson number one for you all. What I did was I engaged with her. I went back, I left her in the sit and I got a charge up by challenging her. Are you ready? Are you ready? And then I let out. Now, just as I was about to release her, somebody right behind her crinkled a water bottle and it spooked her. She got very low and turned around and broke her sit and started walking towards the jump. Now, I kind of heard this, but not really. I knew there was some sort of distraction. So I asked her to sit. She immediately sat and then I released her. And at this moment I released her, 
that crinkling of the water bottle happened again. So she again flicked around. I had to wait till she looked back at me. When I released her then, she was not high on the joy scale. So this was lesson number one. I couldn't give every run like an evaluation of joy. It had to be at some points, the lowest it got and the highest it got. So that's what I did with every run. So run number one, the lowest joy it got was three and a half. The highest joy I gave it was like five and a half. And she actually did pick up some speed and was going a little bit faster. I might've given her a six, but then when I sent her the weave poles, she saw the person who was raking the weave sitting in a chair and it spooked her and she came away towards me. So we killed about five seconds as I got her back into the weave poles, but I remembered this was her first agility trial. She'd been to a match before, but she'd never seen uh, people at the ringside ready to jump in and help out and do some work. So that was new for her. She finished weaving. She picked up some more speed, had a little bobble at the end, but she finished pretty strong. So when I look back at her time, because of all the little bobbles, if I, even if I took out the five seconds delay at the weave poles, she was still 12.5 seconds behind the winning time. So 12.5 seconds, that's a pretty big gap for a border collie to a border collie gap. But I'm like, I'm not discouraged. And I did consider, let's go FEO next. But I'm like, you know, there was such a crazy circumstance with the crackling water bottle. I'm going to do better next time. And so when we do things at Flyball, we just cue everything with a ready, set, go. And it's a trigger. And I thought I'm going to do the rest of my runs with a ready, set, go to get her amped up before I release her at the start line. And that's what I did for the rest of the runs. So run number two was a jumper's run. And this, she got a joy. The lowest joy she got on this one was a five and it went as high as a seven. And she was going places. She didn't like it when I had to call her back. So she would slow down a little bit, but she ended up only eight and a half seconds behind the first place dog. And so I was enthused. I said, let's keep going. The next run is an agility run again. And so this one, I made a massive handling error for a young dog. I just expected too much of her. So obstacle number three, she went off course. And so I just turned her around and I repeated one, two, and three. And when I did that, I really didn't amp her up the way I should have. And so she started off one, two, three, four, a little bit slow. Joy for her was around a four there, but she finished in the middle of the run. She actually got up to a seven and a half and an eight for Joy. And So she was powering in some places. I was so encouraged, but it was agility. She's slower on the seesaw show. So she was again, 10 seconds behind the first place time on that, but we had a lot of bobbles. So I was okay with that. I thought I'm going to give her one more run and I'm really glad I did. So her final jumpers run, I decided this was going to be her last run. And then I was going to go for exhibition only for our last run. And again, she had some bobbles, a couple run outs, but she was 6.2 seconds behind the first place time. So now that gap is going from 12 seconds down to six seconds, definitely high on the joys. Actually, there was no low joy. I thought she was an eight the whole way around on this one. So for those first four runs, what I loved was her recovery. She came back. She actually knocked a bar in one of these runs and normally she would stop dead and look at the bar. She kept going. She acted as if she didn't even notice it. So that was huge. So that led me up to our fifth and final run. So I said to the organizers after her fourth run, that's enough for her. I would like to go FEO. FEO for exhibition only. Let's maximize the joy. And what is maximizing joy anyway? That was my goal for the weekend. I want to maximize joy. And that is, I want to create a positive experience for my dog. Because if you can create a positive experience, that is going to be reinforcing and the dog's going to want to repeat it again. So how do you create that positive experience? Well, number one, there's clarity. Correct is easy. You create an environment where the dog's excited to do what you're doing and what you ask them to do is super easy for them. So you create the clarity, the clarity makes it easy to achieve success. The success gets reinforced, which creates an entire positive loop for the dog. They want to do it again. So creating joy is creating confidence. It's teaching a dog, this is a fun place to be. And that makes them look forward to wanting to go again. And when I took her in the ring for her fourth and fifth run, she was actually barking to go in the ring. She was excited. So I knew we were creating joy for this dog. 
And so going into my FEO run or going into any training environment, guys, like I said off the top, it doesn't matter if you're going into a, a classroom, you want to create joy. You're going into a obedience match anywhere that you can train and make it look like competition or anywhere you just want to add more joy to your training. I suggest you follow these five steps. Number one, you've got to have a goal and my goal, maximize joy. I didn't know what the course was going to look like. I knew there'd probably be about 22 obstacles. And I had a plan that I wanted to strategically reinforce her at different places around the course. And so I knew that I had 60 seconds in an FEO run and I figured she'd get the biggest reinforcement or the longest reinforcement when we were done at the end, which meant I wanted to put in two more reinforcements somewhere in the middle. And my reinforcements I engaged the help of two of my friends. And so what I wanted them to do, I wanted me to be handling the dog. So she saw Susan, the dog agility handler, the same thing she sees every time, but in the middle of the run after a obstacle where I've planned, one of my friends is going to take off and drag a toy. And then I'm going to send her to that toy. And so the reinforcement process is chase, tug, restrain restrain in front of the next obstacle for the next go round. I anticipated it might take 10 seconds for those reinforcement processes. It actually only took eight, but regardless, I knew I couldn't run all 22 obstacles and take two sessions of reinforcement out. So I had to eliminate some of those obstacles. The one that she's not as keen on is the weave pole. So I just left out an entire loop of weaving so that I could maximize joy. So my plan, I was going to start with the same verbal trigger, ready, set, go. But this time I'm going to have one of my friends restrain her, get her a little bit excited, build in anticipation for the go. There's no obvious reinforcement that she could see on me. Now I could have put something in my pocket, but I really wanted to maximize the impact of the reinforcement. Number one, have a goal. Number two, know the rules. I knew that I had 60 seconds. I knew that I could not bring food in the ring, but I knew I could bring a toy in the ring. And so how could I maximize the value of that toy? I could have it be a squeaky toy, but I think that's walking the edge of the rules. It might be a distraction to a dog's outside of the ring. So I didn't want to do that. I knew by putting it on, having a long toy, create a drag would add excitement if that was something she got to chase rather than something she got to drive to and tug. Sure, she likes to tug, but chase down and then tug, we are maximizing the value of the reinforcement. So that came into my plan. I knew my rules. Number three was my plan. What's my reinforcement going to be? How can I maximize that reinforcement? And how could I strategically get that reinforcement put in place where I needed it to be within the ring? I knew that I didn't want the dog to see me carrying a bunch of reinforcers. I wanted my dog to see me handling an agility. I wanted me as the handler doing the moves, be the trigger that we were conditioning that meant joy is following. Somewhere along the course, once I walked it, I would strategically say, you're going to go here. And when my dog finishes this obstacle, I'm going to say, go, go, go. You're going to take off and she's going to chase the toy and have a game of chase, tug, restrain, which meant the person playing with her had to get the tuggy out of her mouth, get it behind her back and restrain her, set her up to go and chase me for the next sequence. So this was really well choreographed, almost as if we'd rehearsed it over and over again, which we didn't. But what we did do is rehearse the game of chase, tug, restraint at the warm up jump long before we ever went in the ring, actually long before the ring was even set. So that I knew that I was using two people who had really good dog training mechanics that they could tug quickly get the toy out in a way that wasn't deflating the dog, get the dog set up to look at the next obstacle. And then I could just start handling again. So number four, rehearse the plan. Now, the only rule I had for this run was there was no rule for this. -y. The reinforcement was coming out at these strategic points, regardless of what happened. So at one point I sent her to the backside of a jump and she wasn't sure what to do. She slowed down and I'm like, no rules. You get in the tunnel. You do not have to take that jump. Even though I cued it, no rules. You get in that tunnel. I told my friends the first reinforcement was going to happen after the seesaw. If she flew off the seesaw, if she jumped off the seesaw, no rules. This one time you just keep running and she chases you. Now, 
Angie, who was handling her within those two points within the ring, was really, really good about the placement of the reinforcement that helped create excellence in her behavior before she got the toy. But she knew even if the dog jumped off, she was getting the reinforcement. One time learning is not going to kill my dog's ability to do agility. And again, my criteria wasn't about getting a perfect dog walk or a perfect seesaw. It was about having maximum joy. Step number five is to execute the plan with joy and celebrate. So I had my 60 seconds. I knew I was going to do two installments of chase, tug, restrain, and then another installment at the end of the run. I kept it fun. I kept it flowing. We went from doing the first opening, ended at the seesaw. I ran out to get to the next handling position. Angie got her in a great position to do the next jump. I went through all the way through where Angie had to run to the other end of the field to get ready to reinforce her after the dog walk. Now, this was a little distracted seeing Angie run, but that's okay. She kept working. She did her dog walk, got another installment of joy, chase, tug, restrain, restrained her in front of the tunnel. I did the final loop up over the A-frame and home. And then my friend Andrea was there at the end to drag the toy that this could chase out of the ring. Now, this knows Andrea really well. She trains with us all the time. She actually owns This Is Little Brother Mission. And so, she was so happy to tug with Andrea at the end of the run. Now, what made this even more perfect than I had planned is that my fellow competitors outside the ring were cheering and clapping and whistling and egging us all on. And I have tears in my eyes just thinking of it. So shout out to all the people over at McCann Dogs, uh, Kale McCann leading the way, screaming at the top of her lungs for us all to run faster for this. It was just such an amazing feeling to have the support of everybody in the agility community. who knew what we were doing, who knew we were maximizing the love of a sport for a dog who was less confident. It was such an amazing experience and one that I think translates to anybody who is going in an FEO, going into a match, going into a training environment where you want to maximize joy. Now, maybe you don't have really good dog training friends that can help you, but you could carry a toy with you and just reinforce after one obstacle. I see so many people going into these FEO runs or not for competition runs and they have their toy out, the dog sees it and they do nothing until the end. And then they throw it over the last jump or the dog misses the weave entry three or four times. And then they reward them because they see that the dog sniffing and they don't want to lose them. Be strategic. Listen, we all start somewhere. I started exactly where you are. So don't feel bad if you feel, oh, I've just blown an opportunity. I see what Susan means now. Give yourself grace we were all there. We all start with not knowing what's the right thing to do, but just think about how you can maximize the joy by maximizing the clarity, because that's what grows the confidence. The clarity comes through your strategic use of what the dog loves as a reinforcer. Go into every training opportunity, keeping things short so that the dog can experience an amazing feeling. And I promise you, Every one of those positive training opportunities builds for the dog. And until you turn around and you say, I've got a dog who now absolutely loves agility. The C and I, we are on that road and it's not too far in our future. I just know it.
Last weekend, I competed at the Canadian Dog Agility World Team Tryouts, and I competed with my dog, this. Now, every dog I have ever tried out for the Canadian World Team, for the World Championships of Dog Agilities, I have got on the team with each and every dog that I've tried out with. But this, for those of you who follow this podcast, you know my dog, this isn't just like every dog I've ever owned. So I thought today I'd give a little debrief about the experience that this and I had at tryouts and what my reflections are from that experience and how I think these reflections are going to help each and every one of you that listen to this podcast that share your life with a dog. You know, it's less than a year ago that this ran her first ever agility trial and completed a run. Last year during the world team tryouts, I took her in the ring for each run and ended up playing games with her because I just didn't feel like she was having as much fun as she could have. She was still very overwhelmed because it was just a few short months since I discovered her nutritional problems and how I could help her have more fun in training. And not just training and dog agility, but training for anything. And though life with this had been a struggle to train, it never was a struggle to love the dog. I've always just been crazy about her, even before she was even born. And so when I could tell early on that she wasn't learning and progressing the way all of my other dogs, border collies or otherwise had, I had to assess my goals. I had to assess my processes with her. And because it was those processes that led me to the goals that I achieved with my past dogs. And so instead of saying, I would like to get this dog ready for world team tryouts when she's two and a half years old, which is approximately when I thought she might be ready. My goals were, I would like to see this dog have as much fun possible while training with me, training, doing anything. And of course my goal was for her to enjoy agility as much as I enjoyed agility, but I wasn't going to train those agility skills, those courses, those sequences, the weave poles. I wasn't going to train any of that until I could reach her and help her to have just a little more fun each day. So that was my goal. And looking back on this past weekend, I had three goals going into the weekend. Number one, I wanted this to have fun. It had been over a month since I'd been in the ring competing with her. And she, every trial, she seemed to have a little bit more fun than others. And that's a really difficult thing to evaluate. How do you evaluate it? Well, I do by based on the speed she's running and little things that she's doing. For example, at our building, which is artificial turf, so the surface is different, maybe a little more secure, she will swim through the weave poles with one leg than the other leg. When she's competing on dirt, she will bounce with two legs. Now, is it because the footing is loose and she's not as secure? I don't know why, but to me, that's a way I could tell, well, she's actually driving harder if she could ever swim through those weave poles. That was just one thing I looked for. If eventually through this process, she started jumping off her contacts, which meant, wow, you're going faster. You're having more fun. I had to go back and evaluate my processes that helped her to know how to do a running contact. And that happened maybe three or four months ago. So back to this weekend, number one goal, I wanted her to have fun. Like every single run out, I wanted to see that she was having fun before we entered the ring while we were in the ring. Number two, for me as a handler, I wanted to make sure I stayed connected with her throughout each and every run. No matter what I did, I wanted to keep my eye on her because I knew that gave this confidence that maybe with some of my other border collies, I could send them to do a job and I could take off and run. But with this, she would often slow down. Think of a dog chasing a rabbit. If the rabbit is maybe three or four or five feet away from that dog, that dog's going to run as hard as it can. But if the rabbit's 30 or 40 or 50 feet away, the dog might give a little bit of, oh, there's a rabbit. And then, ugh, that's just too much effort. I'm not going to do it. And so with this, I had that effect in agility. If I stayed, her bubble of driving hard was about 10 to 15 feet. If I got 
much more ahead than that. She certainly didn't drive as hard as when I was closer, but it was a balancing act because I'm not as fast as most runners that I'm competing with at this level. And so I needed to be able to take off at times, but stay connected. So number one, for her to have fun. Number two, Susan, stay connected. And I knew if number one and number two happened, there was a very good chance of me reaching my number three goal. And that was for this to end up in the top 10 of all five classes. Now I thought if she got in the top 10, she might actually even maybe make reserve on the world team. And part of me said, Susan, put top five when I was writing these goals down. And I just said, no, I can't. And that's unlike me because normally I would go, yeah, let's go for number one. But I felt I don't want to put pressure on this. Not that my goals ever put pressure on my dogs, but that's what I thought. So top 10, that's reasonable. Number one, number two, it might bring me number three. So day one, we had one run. Lo and behold, this, he started off a little slow, but she was barking before we went in the ring. And guess what? She was swimming in her weave poles. Two signs that she was having fun. She was a little more cautious early on, which is not unlike her at the very beginning of any trial, but she still ended up in sixth place place. Now that's important because in order to be considered as a dog selected to the Canadian world team, you needed at least one class in fifth place. And I thought to myself, well, she wasn't even really running that fast for her. And she ended up sixth. This is encouraging. Well, day two, there were little bobbles caused by my not meeting my second goal in that I would take like a microsecond of disconnection from her and I would get a refusal. And so day two, I had two runs with little bobbles in each run. And guess what? We still ended up in the top 10 of each run. She was seventh and eighth in those runs. And so here we are at the end of day two, three top 10 placements, and she's in fourth place overall and just one point out of third place. Mind blown because the top three dogs at this event had a guaranteed spot on the Canadian world team. And I started to think, part of me was like, is she really ready for that? Is she really ready for me to consider taking her to Europe? Was she ready to be running on that big stage? Now I know this E was potentially three to five seconds behind the Canadian dogs. And I know that might be another two or three seconds behind the best dogs in the world. Could I help her to have more joy if we got on the world team by September? I said, Susan, that isn't part of your goals. That's not part of what you should be thinking of this weekend. So I parked it. Went into day three with her in fourth place. The first run was a jumper's run. And there was one little miscalculation on my part with handler pressure in that a dog is running in one direction and the pressure of the handler perpendicular to that will push the dog in a direction you don't want them to go. That bobble cost me another refusal, but otherwise she ran beautifully. And then the final run, it was a very complex course. The first really challenging course of the weekend. And I thought, this is our jam. This is something we can do well. And guess what? More than halfway through the course, she was on fire. She was running harder than she'd ran in any of the other classes. And then I broke rule number two. I felt she was weaving and this was my chance to get far away from her down the dog walk. And I let her go. I saw her finish the last pole. I called her name and I took off running hard. And in that moment of disconnect, she did not go up the dog walk, but she went around the dog walk and went into an off course tunnel. And I knew right then our chances of going to Europe representing Canada were gone. But as she came out of that tunnel, rule number one was also gone. This E having maximum fun. I threw up my hands and I knew exactly I'd let her down. My moment of disconnect was followed by an obvious moment of disappointment for this E. She could see that things had changed, that I wasn't doing what I'd been doing at all those other 17 obstacles. And so I got her back to the weave poles and I restrained her. And I said, are you ready? And are you steady? And I made it fun again, right in the middle of the course, I stopped everything and I just made it fun. She went off and she didn't finish with the same drive as she was going up to that point, but we still finished as a team with great connection. And I can't tell you how good I felt about the five runs that we did. I look at the weekend with a dog who 
for the most part, up until she was 20 months old, I questioned whether she would ever do agility. And I was okay with it. I just wanted her to have joy in something. I went from that to less than a year later, being in a position where we were almost considered a dog for the Canadian world team. And so the reflections on all of that to me are, what are your goals with your dog? And are your processes leading you to those goals? And for me, any of those processes we have with our dogs need to include the dog's emotional state about what we're doing. Meaning that you need to have a way to evaluate that your dog is having fun. And having fun means they are attacking. This he was barking and screaming before we went into the last two runs at the tryouts. And that just brought me so much joy. I don't know if it brought the people around me that much joy, but we can fix that. And so whatever your goals are, maybe your dog, you've got a chronic house training problem, or you have a leash reactivity challenge with your dog, or your dog won't bring back the toy, or your dog barks too much. Whatever your challenge is, if you have not progressed in your goal to overcome that challenge, please evaluate your processes and include one that maximizes the joy for the dog. And if you aren't maximizing the joy for the dog, then what gives us the right to have any expectations for that dog? What gives us the right to believe that dog shouldn't be reactive on leash, that dog should bring your toy back, or that dog should stop peeing in your house? What can you do to arrange coincidences for the dog, to establish an environment where they feel safe, where there is a way for them to have joy. And if you haven't, please go back and listen to podcast episode number 203 and 204, where I talk about this is journey in my discovery of her GI problems and the massive turnaround and how that discovery and how, when I changed her diet, absolutely was a huge exponential jump in her ability to have joy in our training. Now, did it change overnight? No, here we are a little over a year later, we're a long way from where we are. And one of the most important things that happened this weekend, besides her swimming her wee pools, was when I had those little baubles and I had to bring her back, she didn't shut down and sniff. She said, let's go. That's a dog who's saying, I actually like what we're doing here. And if that is what you measure with your dog every day, that you progress that joy while you're progressing your goal, then your processes are in place. And if your processes aren't in place to lead to your goal, then reevaluate your processes. You don't have to reevaluate the goal, reevaluate the processes. So my goal is still to get this on the Canadian world team. That has always been my goal. And if it never happened, well, guess what? Some of my goals I don't reach. That doesn't mean I don't love the process of attempting to attain those goals. So I don't alter my goal. I alter the processes that lead me to the attainment of those goals. So if you're not progressing overcoming those challenges, because those challenges are going to affect the relationship you have with your dog. If you aren't doing something that helps you to progress at least on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis, progress towards a better outcome for whatever your challenge is. If you're not progressing towards where you want to be, re-evaluate your processes. Something, my friend, is flawed. Something in the process. And if the first note, the first change you make is the ways that you've attempted to have more fun with your dog, then I promise you that is a great first step to come up with new processes that lead you to that eventual outcome, the ultimate goal that you're trying to attain. For me and this we're going to continue to train hard because training hard is just having fun. Back at home, doing the little things that make her drive with more joy, planning to take her to more locations. And when I get more joy in all of these different obstacles, then we're going to take it on the road 
and have more fun at more agility venues. And I just want to give a special shout out to every one of you listening to this podcast that has been a supporter of Team This. We feel your love. We feel your support. And that's what keeps us going and trying harder every time we go out there and train. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you to each and every one of you. At the end of this video, I'm going to include all five of this is runs from the Canadian world team tryouts. So you can see all five of the runs and listen to me talking to her, giving her the cues that I give her as we go through each and every run. I'll see you next time right here on Shape by Dog.
go, 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 go. Go, 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 go. Reactive, fearful, and shut down were words that people might use to describe my now three-year-old border collie, this. This he was afraid of everything, really. Afraid of bars falling, she would leave work. Where a normal border collie would bounce maybe 12 or 15 feet, she could only bounce eight. Even in her own building, here at a seminar as an 18-month-old dog, she was distracted. She wouldn't engage with me. She wouldn't move forward. She had zero interest in tugging. And here we are now, just over a year later. And this weekend, she not only competed at the U.S. Open, she thrived at the U.S. Open. With a mantra of helping my dog to find daily joy, we looked for progress, not perfection. I hope you realize what's possible when you bring clarity into your dog's life. You help fan the flames of confidence, and from that confidence, joy can grow.